just to give a little bit of overview, I am, as Tim mentioned, a computer architect by history, which means uh, that, like Tim, I look a lot at the hardware software interface issues and the design issues at the organizational level around how to build processors and embedded systems. Um, but in the process of trying to understand how to make those kinds of systems more power efficient, I got pulled into mobile computing and mobile sensing about 15 years ago. And uh, that pulled me into Internet of Things over the years as well. And then the last piece of this is that about two years ago, a sense of looking for something different pulled me into applying for a State Department fellowship called the Jefferson Science Fellowship that exposed me more directly to policy issues than I'd been exposed to in the past. And so it's that confluence of computer architecture plus Internet of Things and mobile sensing plus um, policy issues with a bit of power efficiency throughout that I hope to convey today. And we'll see where I get to in all of that, okay? So I think I will start by saying, uh, this is kind of like what I did on summer vacation. Uh, what I did last year is that I participated as a Jefferson Science Fellow within the US Department of State. So the goal of this program is, or I should say was, to bring senior tenured uh, science and technology and engineering and math faculty members into the State Department for one year to serve as technical uh, experts to serve as explainers. And in my case, I was there full time for a year from August 2015 to August 2016 there in DC. And uh, I re enlisted, if you will, for a remote uh, year from August 2016 onwards to do part time and remote work from Princeton. Um, but for various reasons, uh, I decided to cut my time short. And <laughs> And so as of last week, I mailed back my badge. And you guys are my first audience for a talk since I am no longer a State Department employee. So um, if you were to ask me something, maybe I would be more candid than a week ago. <laughs> uh, so just briefly, um, I don't expect you to read this eye chart, but this is the org chart for the Department of State uh, uh, so far. And probably likely to change dramatically soon. Uh, and I have three things circled. Those are the three places that you'll find computing policy within the Department of State. And I don't expect you to be able to read the tiny fonts. Uh, but the one down here is the Office of the Cyber Coordinator, so cybersecurity issues. The one over here is Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. So that's basically free speech and anti-censorship, where computing technology plays a role. And the one here, uh, within economic and business affairs is an office of computing and information policy. And I was in this red box. So what I worked on was um, within the CIP office, within the Economics Bureau, I was particularly focused within the subgroup that did multilateral affairs. So in terms of topics, this was communications, computing, internet, radio frequency spectrum, digital economy issues. So. The reason your cell phone works when you land in a foreign country is because the countries got together and negotiated which frequency bands will work worldwide and, and, and how they're going to harmonize this, the, the use of spectrum. So that's one example of something that got worked on within that office. Um, also issues related to uh, emerging technologies, including Internet of Things. Um, in general, the multilateral part means places where multiple governments get together to talk about things. So that is UN agencies like the International Telecommunications Union, but also other groups, the G7, the G20, the, uh, the OECD, which came out of the Marshall Plan and includes now um, the European countries plus a broader set of countries, developed economies as well. So CIP played a broad role in a range of issues. Some of the ones you may have heard about, um, rolling out 5G spectrum is one. Um, during the year that I was in DC, the Safe Harbor Agreement, which was an agreement between the US and the EU regarding how European user data would be treated by American uh, internet companies such as Google and Facebook, uh, that agreement was struck down and they had to renegotiate a new agreement uh, which is now in place called Privacy Shield. Um, also while I was there, there was a non-trivial negotiation to encourage um, improved 3G cellular service in the Palestinian um, West Bank uh, and improved cooperation on cellular service between Israel and Palestine. 
a, a bunch of the issues within the office ran to who controls the internet and who's allowed to access the internet. So non, it, it's fairly common for someone to turn off some amount of internet access within their country and then that gets sort of notified around the world and people try to get Twitter turned back on um, for a country during a period of political instability. Um, so issues of connectivity and issues of who runs the, uh, the internet are, were pretty big. And the last thing, and one that I spent a lot of time on, was issues of technical standards. Um, in particular, the ITU, the UN Agency for Computing and Communications, still has a fairly um, robust amount of effort devoted to governments coming together to discuss technical standards. And this might be surprising to you if you're familiar with, say, IEEE discussing uh, technical standards or the IETF, but actually in addition to those and other industry-led consortia or sort of stakeholder-led consortia, there is a governmental standardization work. And it was used for a range of different purposes and that's one of the things that I spent a lot of time working on, uh, particularly as it influences economic development for different countries. Uh, so what did I do all day? Um, there's sort of two versions of this. There's the, when I was in DC, I was basically the explainer. I was um, the, the, essentially the only computer science expert uh, for many of the offices. And so if there was a question about an emerging technology, um, whether it was deeply in my focus area of computer architecture or more broadly, if it had to do with computers, there'd be sort of this, let's ask Margaret. And, <laughs> and Margaret would either answer it or Google, Google furiously and then answer it, right? Um, my crowning glory was writing what I considered to be a pretty credible summary of quantum computing in four pages um, for a lay person, only to be asked, can you please shorten it to two? And that's where things got rough. Um, also writing US positions on different issues and prep preparation for meetings. The other thing is that since a lot of my work had to do with this UN agency, the ITU, I spent literally four out of the 12 months in what I would call ITU land, which is a, a virtual place, but um, there are different face-to-face -face meetings that happen frequently, two weeks long. You go, you encamp somewhere, and you discuss things. You discuss things by negotiating things, by looking at uh, Microsoft Word documents and negotiating track changes on them word by word. Uh, and in particular, I, I went to about eight of these different meetings, two weeks apiece, pre-meeting developing the US position and then during the meeting advocating for that position. So that, if you're curious, that's what one does all day in these kinds of positions. One of the things that came up a lot were Internet of Things issues. And, and so I will talk a little bit about that both in terms of the policy issues and in terms of the technical issues and then pull back to talk about how they arise in these international policy settings. So um, just to make sure we're all on the same page, this is sort of a utopian view, but what is the Internet of Things? The Internet of Things is a pretty broad and slightly buzzwordy phrase, but it pertains to the situations where we have um, intelligence, computing, and communication capabilities associated with physical objects in a way that allows us to sense, analyze, communicate, and act on data that we've collected about them. Uh, so it runs the real gamut from uh, intelligence sensing for water quality, uh, a range of different energy efficiency and energy relevant uh, topics like smart grids and uh, smart homes, uh, smart transportation, uh, and then structural issues like earthquake proofing or uh, structurally sound or dynamically adaptive structures. So there's a broad sense of what it might be, all organized around this idea of collecting data, analyzing it, fusing the, in the information in different ways, and then acting on it. In terms of another view of it, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Gartner hype cycle, but here's a less utopian view. Uh, so the Gartner hype cycle comes out once a year. Um, this is the 2015 version. Uh, the x-axis is different um, phases of a technology's development, starting with an innovation trigger that is something that allows an idea to get catalyzed, um, and moving through the peak of inflated expectations, the trough of disillusionment, and basically saying that when we first get an idea, our expectations of it are, are fairly modest, and then we move up to being really, really excited about the idea um, before 
crashing back downwards when we realize how hard the idea is to make real. And then we climb ourselves back out again um, to get towards being sort of real productive um, technical capabilities around that idea. And uh, each year, Gartner takes different technologies or different buzzwordy phrases and arranges them on the hype cycle, giving their best estimate of when they will become sort of real productive parts, real economic drivers, real sort of technical capabilities. And so the key thing is that basically when I arrived at the State Department, IoT was literally at peak hype. And so you can either sort of cynically view this and say, it's just a buzzword, um, it's things that we've been doing for a long time in different ways, um, there's nothing particularly new here, or you can look at it and say, as engineers, it's our goal to get it from peak hype um, out to the plateau of productivity. And the other thing is that not only was IoT at peak hype, but there were IoT-related uh, technologies sort of coming up the curve behind it, like smart homes and so forth. Um, so that's where we were in 2015. One of the interesting things is to go back to the roots and see which parts of IoT are new and which parts are sort of rooted in things that are much, much older than that. Um, so many of you may not know who this is, but Mark Weiser was considered the pioneer in u ubiquitous computing, the main young career, early career award for ubiquitous computing is named in memory of him because he died much too soon, but he was the chief technologist at Xerox Park in 1991. So literally 25 years ago, um, he said this, the most profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves in the fabric of everyday life until they're indistinguishable from it. And so uh, he is considered by many to be the visionary who started to think about uh, Internet of Things style approaches um, to sensing the world and embedding computer systems into the world. Uh, another thing that amazes me is to say, let's go back to what is the world he was living in when he said that and to see what the technology looked like. Um, and, and it makes it even more remarkable that he had the vision of technology disappearing because for those of us who were there, I can assure you it didn't look like it was ready to disappear. Um, so in the upper uh, left, you see a cell phone of the era. Um, there's the handset that you might recognize. But then the batteries were so big that you either carried them around in a separate bag or you plugged the cell phone into your car, and we call them car phones because you wouldn't use them sort of truly mobily as we do now. So that's sort of observation number one. Observation number two has to do with the computing capabilities of, of that era. So the 1991, a really cool computer that you could buy is this Apple Macintosh. Um, what I wanted to highlight is that where we now have uh, roughly gigahertz uh, clocks, the, the clock speed, that is the basic um, heart rate at which the processor would process things, was, was measured then in megahertz. So basically one one thousandth as fast as the typical clock rate now. Likewise, about one one thousandth the memory, uh, megabytes instead of gigabytes. And similarly, tiny hard drives as well. So megabytes of hard drive where now we have gigabytes, terabytes, and so forth. So huge changes in both the communications technology and the computing technology and then the final thing is, this is a magazine cover also from 1991. Uh, GPS uh, was not widely available. In fact, it was still like, largely a uh, technology of the future. It was expectantly awaited. And if you read the fine print on this um, magazine cover, what you'll see is that it was envisioned for marine navigation, for helping ships move around. The idea that we would individually have several GPSs that we would carry around with us day to day was um, simply not conceived of yet. So that's what technology looked like when Weiser made his visionary idea about things disappearing. Um, but he wasn't alone in hoping for um, internet controlled uh, technology to be a part of our world. And in fact, there was a challenge at the 1990 and 1991 interop conferences uh, to create an internet controlled toaster. Um, so at the 1991, sorry, uh, pictures were low resolution in 1990 also. So sorry about the quality of this picture, but there's a guy 
with a microphone standing near a toaster. Um, in 1990, they had an internet controlled toaster, meaning you could start and stop the toasting using network packets. Very exciting. Um, but that's not fully Internet of Things yet. Um, in 1991, they had an Internet controlled crane that would allow you to put the bread in and out robotically as well. And then we really achieved uh, some IoT status. So this is considered one of the first uh, Internet of Things demos, the, the robotically controlled toaster at 1991's Interop. So from that, we've come to a world now where IoT devices are all the rage. We talk about them a lot. And there's a lot of consumer-facing consumer devices that are very familiar to us. So thermostats that automatically learn good settings for us based on our movement patterns and our preferences, um, health monitors. Uh, it's frightening to me, but an internet-enabled fork that will tell you when you're eating too fast or too slow. Um, and so on and so forth. So that consumer-facing side of the Internet of Things is one big aspect of it. Um, but in addition to that, there's environmental sensing, there's smart agriculture, there's medical devices, uh, there's smart manufacturing, and there's uh, infrastructural uses like electrical grids and industrial uses that become this uh, major and important part of the Internet of Things space, even though they aren't quite as visible and consumer facing. Um, and what you see across all of this is a massive projected market by 2025, four to 11 trillion dollars. So it's a big market um, with a lot of different components to it. Um, many different people are looking to sort of jumpstart economic growth in their region, in their area, based on Internet of Things devices. And it's also because it isn't just internet controlled or internet enabled forks and so forth, but it's actual infrastructural safety critical, critical systems like the electric grid, we're seeing an increased focus on security, on reliability, and on policy and regulatory issues around the internet of things as well. So it's partly based on market size and partly based on the types of markets that you see this um, attention from both technologists and policymakers. So where are we? If you sort of look through the space of different people involved, um, the users might see IoT as offering some exciting possibilities, but they also have some concerns about privacy, about security, interoperability, safety, that are in some cases causing them to be a little bit reticent about uptake of these new systems. Um, policymakers, good policymakers, um, are right to consider these consumer concerns and decide how, when, and if to respond. And if they do respond, they'll often respond with legislation and regulation to try to make them safer, uh, to try to offer better consumer assurances. Uh, so where do we as technologists fit in? Um, the way I look at it, the way I came back from my year in DC is to say that there's really exciting technical opportunities in finding solutions to these issues. Um, and in fact, our freedom to innovate rests on our ability and our willingness to find technical solutions rather than solely relying on policy concerns. I think if we abdicate responsibility on some of these issues, the policymakers will move in, and that may be appropriate in some cases, but I don't want to abdicate the technical solutions or avoid them. And in me as a computer architect in particular, I look at it and I say, well, there's a central role for people who understand how to design hardware, how to design interfaces, how to design abstractions. The IoT fundamentally needs reliable, high performance, energy efficient building blocks to reach its full potential. And they have to interoperate reliably and securely. And I argue that the folks who have been designing hardware and software systems for a while have some expertise to bring to bear to this. And we need to play in this space and not abdicate responsibility to others. So, to dig in a little more, um, I've enumerated, this is in no way a complete list, but I've enumerated a set of issues that arguably are key to making the IoT work. Um, power efficiency is one of them, performance is another, being able to program them reasonably, um, identifying appropriate uh, radio frequency spectrum for them. There's privacy issues, there's security issues, there's interoperability issues. And one could give a talk about any one of these and dig in for a whole hour. One could give a talk about all of them and dig in for days or weeks. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna focus on three of them. Uh, 
they're just three that I've thought about more, to be honest. It's not that I think that they are the most important, but they're the ones where I have maybe more to say. So that's what I'm gonna do for the rest of the time, is talk about these three in a little more detail. So power efficiency first. Um, so let's look at it from the policymaker's point of view. Uh, there's a, a, a few reasons why policymakers should be thinking about um, the power, so there's, there's multiple faces to IoT and power. So one thing is that using Internet of Things sensing and data analysis can actually make grids more efficient. Um, it can help with the energy efficiency of buildings and so forth. Um, assuming, we, assuming we care about that, the other face of it is how much power do these devices and systems use themselves and why does that matter? And so this slide gives a few reasons for that. Um, one reason for that, one thing that came up a fair amount in policy arenas that I was involved in is the notion of e-waste. So if we're putting these devices out into the landscape to measure, um, and if we are not actually collecting them at the end, then we're generating a non-trivial amount of e-waste, and there's an argument that low power um, execution, low power uh, system operation can actually reduce that e-waste by reducing the size of the batteries that are used, in some cases eliminating the size of the batteries that's used. Um, but if that's not uh, sufficiently motivational for you, then I'll give one that hits a little closer to home, namely your head, um, and that is the idea that some of these IoT devices are gonna be implanted medical devices. Uh, so for example, uh, I have hand tremors, I have benign essential tremors, um, and one of the uses of these implanted brain stimulators is evidently to reduce hand tremors. So I'm looking forward to this being reliable enough to try out. I'm not ready yet to be experimented. But anyway, what that picture shows, the lower picture, shows an implanted device for deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's or for tremors. And uh, the key is that if you are going to put a medical device inside a living being, there are a whole range of issues to grapple with, but one of them is that if it uh, dissipates a fair amount of power per unit area, it will actually burn the tissue that it is adjacent to. Um, it's, it's pretty easy to, to burn tissue. You would hurt your finger if you touched most modern processors without a heat sink right now. And so if we put a lot of compute plus a radio inside the human body, we have to stay under fairly constrained power budgets to do it. There's also issues of uh, life cycle and replacement. So if you need brain surgery every time um, you need to replace the device or work on the batteries, then you'd be motivated to uh, develop lower power systems to, to operate in that space. So what can we do about this? Um, so there's a set of research around um, novel energy harvesting devices that can either um, help with recharging batteries or in some cases can avoid the need for batteries entirely by using supercapacitors and other um, uh, lower e-waste techniques. So this broad area is called energy harvesting and it refers to either using solar cells or vibrational or, or um, thermal approaches to generate energy. One of the real questions is we have decades of experience designing computer systems that basically are trained to run marathons. So we assume that we're gonna turn on the computer and it's gonna run for a long, long time. And we design operating systems and we design applications that are gonna run for a long, long time at a steady pace. Um, but if you start thinking about energy harvesting, then your energy availability fluctuates. There may be times where uh, you have a, a pool of energy that you could use and then other times where you've depleted your energy reserves and you can't do as much computer communication for a while. And so one question is, should we be redesigning some of the software layers to be more like sprinters and do bursts of work and then shut down rather than being like marathoners that are sort of steady space, steady pace for a long time. So that's a case where we take something that's technically driven, like a new energy harvesting technology, but it pushes up through the system layers and changes how we as computer scientists might design software layers as well. Um, another thing that comes up in this area that I think is interesting and relevant across a number of different fields is the issue of balancing computation and data communication. So, um, in particular, when we design computer systems, the, the CPU, central processing unit, has historically been the star of the show. 
um, it has, it's, it's central, right? And so we think a lot about compute and less about communication. In many of these systems, uh, communication energy greatly dominates compute energy. So for example, in my sort of middle of the road cell phone, the communication energy per byte communicated is about a thousand times more than the compute energy per instruction executed. So what that says is if I can do a, a little more computation local on a device out near the edge of the network where the data is being collected, I may be able to downsize it to the point where I can communicate less off to the cloud. And in the process, that compute near data can actually save energy relative to sending the data elsewhere. So what we need to do is think about ways to optimize applications to balance these two better. So rather than the knee-jerk reaction of let's uh, not ask too much of this poor helpless edge device and send it all to the cloud, we're gonna think more holistically and say, sending it to the cloud costs energy, computing out at the edge costs energy, and let's figure out what's the right mix of those two before we go any further. And this is something that um, I've worked a little bit on over the years, and in fact, it's amazing how enduring some of these ratios have been. Not the precise number, but the fact that you have to think about these ratios. So one of the projects that I worked on about uh, 15 years ago was a project to do wildlife tracking in Kenya, where we were building um, wildlife, we were building collars to put on zebras to put out in an area that had essentially no uh, communication connectivity. So we were building peer-to-peer data swap protocols. Uh, the, the short version of the story is we were deciding what radio range would be useful to us. So one option is to send everything all the way from an individual tracking collar on an individual zebra all the way back to a base station, which might be tens of kilometers away. Another option was to be able to just do very short range radio um, communication to another node nearby and eventually hop the data back. Uh, in the process of making that decision, we wanted to see what the radio energy looked like and how it compared to the compute energy on the collar itself so that we could decide about downsizing data as well as what radio range to use. And so this is, this is like a nostalgic trip in the Wayback Machine for me. Um, but this graph comes out of a paper from 2005 so it's three different radios of that era, uh, from left to right, increasing radio range. And on the y-axis is that ratio that I mentioned of the number of instruction cycles that use the same energy as one byte transmitted over the radio. And note that it's a log scale here. Um, so what you can see is that back then, that ratio was 1,000 to a million X. Um, today, my cell phone is around 1,000 X. Uh, that motivates a couple things. It, motivates the, it motivated our choice for these very local peer-to-peer um, -peer data swaps, but it also motivated us to develop very aggressive onboard data compression using the processor out on the collar itself, like on the zebra, to downsize as much as possible the data before we sent it anywhere else. So we were thinking about this um, 10, 15 years ago. The interesting thing is the degree to which it's still relevant. So in the upper um, figures, I'm showing an example. This is more, sorry, more brain sensing. Uh, this is a colleague of mine, Naveen Verma, who does work on um, seizure prediction for epilepsy patients using custom circuits. And so what his work has found is that if you can do some of the computation related to seizure prediction right at the sensing device, inside the brain, or inside the skull, uh, then you get around a 15x uh, power savings. That's partly by computing near the data, so you don't have to communicate as much data elsewhere, and it's partly by specializing as much as possible that compute so that you can get the, the power as low as possible. And in that way, they greatly reduce the, the, the data communication to the outside world, which greatly reduces the power. Another example of this from my own group is an is a intelligent uh, traffic application that we built about five years ago where we were using a cell phone, at that point an iPhone 3, as essentially a dashboard camera. 
um, mounted in the front of a car. And it was doing analysis of traffic signals in the video feed that it was seeing and giving speed advisories based on seeing red lights and green lights, collaboratively sharing that information with other cars nearby in order to give a, a speed advisory of what was a smooth uh, flowing traffic speed to adopt. By doing the uh, signal analysis there at the cell phone rather than communicating it elsewhere, we got about a two to 10x power savings. Um, there's another layer of energy savings here, which is by, by giving intelligent speed estimates, we actually saved gas as well as, <laughs> as, well as um, battery life on the cell phone. So this was two layers of power savings. One was compute and one was um, cars. So basically these things recur throughout time. Uh, and what you're seeing as the 5G uh, communication standards get um, more refined, you're seeing this notion of mobile edge computing coming up prominently in them as well. So basically people are thinking hard about how to make this um, both uh, uh, a part of the 5G cellular standards and also a well-supported low latency mechanism for doing latency sensitive compute out of the edge of the network. So that's nice to see. Um, the follow on to this will be how do we actually create architectures and APIs that support it well so that we can compute on the cell phone when that makes sense, on a sensor, on a chip, or in the cloud. So in terms of sort of wrapping up this part, I would say that there's two key things to think about. One is that uh, we as designers often think about one piece of the system, say a, a particular chip that is our specialty. And a lot of these issues will require us to think more broadly about systems design overall. And the second thing is the degree to which communications matters for power efficiency. So that's two takeaways from this part. Um, but I promised you power, security, and privacy, so I'm gonna move on now to security. And I think everyone probably is quite motivated these days about security and the Internet of Things, at least if you've been watching the news, I hope you're motivated because the news over the past couple of years has been fairly scary. Uh, so a good chunk of Ukraine lost its power when its grid was hacked. Um, so these are cases where intelligent control systems within uh, something like a, an electric grid are run by computers. They're run essentially a, an IoT system. And if there are vulnerabilities that allow someone else to get in and take over software control of them, then they can turn off your country's power. Uh, closer to home, there was a, a water reservoir just north of New York City um, where the, the reservoir dam controls were uh, hacked as well. And then last fall, there were major um, uh, internet outages that were related to simple internet connected devices such as um, web connected security cameras that were taken over and rather than impinging a security problem on the owner of that camera, instead malware was installed that then launched a distributed denial of service attack on other bits of infrastructure. First, a web page that had spoken ill of IoT security issues, Krebs on security, and then subsequently a larger uh, DDoS attack on a major uh, DNS server that affected most of the East Coast including Princeton, where we were having an IoT security workshop the day of the major DDoS attack. Um, so uh, what's, what this has led to is, first of all, a recognition of the secondary impact of insecure IoT devices, that it's not just that it might affect the security of you know, my home network, but it, that it affects the security of the whole internet if these devices are taken over. The second thing is the degree to which even computer scientists like uh, Bruce Schneier are now acknowledging the need for policy and government steps in addition to purely technical solutions. So it's clear that there will be a dual solution and the question is um, what's everyone's role in that? I just wanted to give one view into this from a sort of computer architecture perspective. There are a lot of different things that we should be doing to improve IoT security and it's gonna really be a unified effort across many different spaces. One of the things that I believe in is the role of formal specification and formal verification as part of that. Uh, so, and zooming in even more narrowly, 
Uh, one of the things that my group has worked a lot on lately are formal methods for uh, analyzing and verifying that the ordering of events is, is correct relative to a specification. Um, and this is a fairly obscure uh, research area called memory consistency models. If you studied computer architecture over the past four years, you might have like nightmares about memory consistency models. No one likes them. Um, but the thing that's new now is the degree to which they have been shown to play a role in a range of Internet of Things related security exploits. So if there's something that nobody likes and is hard to get right, and yet every system relies on having the correct memory ordering of loads and stores, um, there's a danger of security vulnerabilities around them. And so that's where we are right now. Uh, what my group has done, and I don't have time to go into deep detail about any one tool, but my group has developed a family of tools that check the ordering of events at different levels. So starting from um, comparing that a given process or implementation matches its architectural specification to then reaching up further into the operating system, the compiler, and the high-level languages, and to see that across all these different levels, the loads and stores happen in the order that they're expected to happen so that they are computing on the values that should be computed on. This seems really basic. I can assure you things Mistakes happen. The basic, the sort of half slide version of our approach is we take a formal specification of what is the correct event ordering, and we turn those into what are called happens before graphs, which say, for example, you should fetch an instruction before you decode it, before you execute it. Could be something simpler, similar, simple like that, um, or it could be something more complicated that has to do with different pipe stages and interactions between threads. The fundamental issue, the fundamental observation of a happens before graph is we, we enumerate many possible scenarios. We enumerate all possible scenarios if we can. If a particular scenario has a cyclic happens before graph, that is A before B before C before A, if it's cyclic, it can't physically happen. So we can say uh, that scenario simply can't happen because it would require A to happen before itself. So we can rule out any concerns about that. If it's an acyclic scenario, then it's observable, and we have to think about whether we're okay with it being observable or not. Um, so that's the underlying secret sauce, and it turns out that these days, you can check these happen through four graphs very efficiently using uh, satisfiability modulo theory solvers, which have gotten super fast over the past 20 years. So what I'm gonna do is talk about one version of how this affects Internet of Things. One of the things that you want to be able to do in an Internet of Things device is load a new version of software reliably and check through a signed crypto protocol that a trusted source loaded trusted software. So we can talk about that in terms of the steps that are shown on the left-hand side of the slide. But we can also display it as a happens before graph that is on the right-hand side of the slide. This is simplified to a great degree but it still shows that that is an acyclic happens before graph. And in fact, one of the things that can happen in this version of this protocol is that there's a point where a malicious second copy can be slid in at just the right moment where the user thinks that they have uh, correctly checked that the right code was loaded by the correct user, um, but actually I slide in my evil code at the last minute and get you to execute it instead of the correct code. This sounds dumb. This sounds like the kind of thing that shouldn't happen, but Intel found it was happening in some of their deployed systems. So it's, it's uh, arguably dumb and simple. It's good for a talk, but it's also things that happen in real systems. Uh, so what we have done is come up with ways to take these IoT level examples and express them as happens before graphs in order to identify where additional edges can be imposed into these ordering relationships to cause um, the concerning situations to, to be portrayed in cyclic happens before graphs, which means that they are forbidden and they won't happen. So, our work is to enumerate these event orderings in order to identify vulnerabilities at design time. Uh, 
it, just going back to that sort of multi-layer stack of tools, where are we, how have we used these tools? Um, I think the, the proof of the pudding is in what bugs we have found. So we found bugs in a processor simulator that's used by essentially all architects called Gem5. We found bugs in a research proposal for a new type of cache coherence. We found bugs in an IBM commercial compiler, and they asked that if we talk about their bugs, they're happy talking about their bugs, but they asked us to say that they're fixed, so they're fixed. Version 13.1.5 uh, fixes them. We found bugs in currently under-designed commercial processors, and um, we found bugs in the proof of correctness of a set of compiler mapping. So it wasn't just that we found a bug in a compiler, but we found a case where researchers had proven the correctness of a whole family of compiler optimizations, and we showed that the proof was wrong. Um, in the process of showing the compiler bugs and the proof bugs, it now looks like the C11 memory model might not be really what it should be, um, and so we're kind of pushing on that to change, to make it more correctly implementable in hardware. And then the most recent thing is um, actually listed in the middle of there, and that's the RISC-V instruction set architecture specification. So our recent work on TriCheck checks that a high-level language like C and a low-level processor, like a given processor design, and an intermediate level instruction set architecture that the three align to give correct memory orderings. And it turns out that for RISC-V, which is an emerging open source processor design, um, not only are some implementations incorrect, but actually the whole instruction set architecture specification is incorrect in a way that says that RISC-V cannot correctly compile certain C11 programs. And so we're working now um, to work with RISC-V to try to address that and, and get to an ISA spec that can correctly compile from, from important high-level languages like C++. Okay, so that is the issue of verification and security. And I think the, the main takeaway for me there is there are a lot of things that we need to do about security. But for me, the key is this interplay of security, reliability, and verification, where we can pre-verify systems and provide better, more rigorous um, design time assurances, we should and we need to. Uh, so then that gets me to privacy. Uh, and you can't really talk about IoT without talking about privacy. Uh, so um, that's where we are. I'm gonna start by telling the story of Governor Weld's medical records. So in the mid-1990s, William Weld was governor of Massachusetts. And in order to encourage um, research, on a range of sort of public health issues, the state of Massachusetts decided to release a very large data set of, of quote unquote anonymized medical data for their state employees, for all their state employees. Uh, they removed the obvious identifiers like the name, the street address, and the social security number, but otherwise they released essentially all data about all uh, state employees. Um, well, uh, Massachusetts has a lot of smart people in it, and one of them, uh, was is Latanya Sweeney, who then was an MIT graduate student. She's now a Harvard faculty member. And she basically purchased some additional information, namely voter records for the state of Massachusetts. And between the quote unquote anonymized medical data and the publicly available voter records, she was able to uh, use what's called side information to fully identify Governor Weld in the data set. It's a, it's a data set of state employees. He's the governor, he's a state employee. So she figured, she basically used a process of elimination. There were only six people in Cambridge with his birth date. Only three of those were men. Only one was in the same zip code that was known to be where he lived. And so what seemed like a very large data set, easy to hide an individual in, quickly became essentially a uniquely identifiable piece of information. And so if you're a smart graduate student and you want to do something with a flourish, send the governor his medical records to show that you got him, right? Um, so what this really shows is the degree to which um, what was the established best practice at the time, which is called k-anonymity, was very vulnerable. So k-anonymity was the idea that as long as there are k people in the data set who look alike, we should be safe. But the issue is that you know maybe k in this case was six, there's always some side information that will let you to let you winnow down that six to something smaller. 
Um, and in fact, in the US around now, close to 90% of us can get uniquely identified by zip code, birth date, and gender, all three of which, many of which we have on our Facebook profiles, right? So um, something to think about. So beyond K-anonymity, uh, there's been a range of work trying to attack this theoretically. And one thing that has been sort of noticed is the degree to which uh, side information and sequences of information can cause K-anonymity to be vulnerable. And we saw that in the previous example with uh, Governor Weld. You can see it here. Here's a sequence of two queries. If I say, how many people in the database um, have this sickle cell genetic trait? And then how many people in the database not named Martin Nosey have the sickle cell trait? So if you do those two queries in sequence, then even though you haven't accessed any of my data, my data could be fully encrypted, seems as secure as anything, you still can know uh, the answer by subtraction to, to my medical status on that issue. So side channel information is one. Uh, qu series of queries are another issue. So in response to that, Cynthia Dwork and her colleagues at Microsoft Research came up with the idea of differential privacy, which is a rigorous mathematical theoretical technique uh, that bounds to a small value epsilon the probability of detecting the presence or absence of any one person in a collected pot of data. And you can design the blurring to get to a targeted desired value of epsilon to basically arbitrarily lower the probability that you can tell whether I'm in that database or not. And if you can lower the probability enough, then basically you can't, you can't tell what my sickle cell trait is or you can't tell what Governor Weld's records are because we have blurred to make the presence or absence of any one person indistinguishable. So it's stronger than K-anonymity in being uh, a resilient series of queries and in being resilient to side information. It's great. Um, there's just one thing. It assumes that you have your big pot of data already collected. And so we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, it, there have been uses of differential privacy in the Internet of Things. Uh, so uh, Microsoft Research did some work on smart metering, so collecting information from different electric meters and aggregating it with enough noise that if you're just doing things like uh, shaping electric grid management, you can do that without uniquely and in a fine-grained way knowing precisely how much electricity usage my house or my rooms are using at any one time. Likewise, there's been work on smart buildings techniques that use differential privacy. And then lastly and up top, um, my group did work on doing urban mobility models from call detail records from cell phones um, where we applied differential privacy over the top of it so that even though under the covers we were developing these models based on individual time and position stamps from individual AT&T consumers, there was a shield over the top of differential privacy to eliminate or reduce, greatly reduce the likelihood of being able to discover um, who was in the data set or who wasn't and where they were going at any particular time. And I think for the interest of time, I won't play the movie, but the idea is that the left-hand side is the original data and the right-hand side is the differentially private blurring version of the data. And one key challenge with differential privacy is, yeah, I can blur until I reach an arbitrarily good level of privacy, a good epsilon, but then the question is, have I blurred so much that there's no useful accuracy left in the data? And so the, the goal of our work was to show that you could still do urban planning, you could do telecommuting studies, you could do a range of useful studies with this data, even after you had blurred it to allow individuals to retain their privacy. Um, but as I said, this all assumes that you have a big pot of data that you've already collected. And with IoT, the key is that you're, you're often analyzing uh, streams of data. And so the next step in this is going to be to to be able to blur on the fly. Um, there is a theoretical construct for that called pan privacy that is the idea of differential privacy on an arbitrary snapshot of data. But the question is how practical is it? Um, and it, my view is that the answer will be in can we do some of this on the device using hardware support? Um, can the hardware support be energy efficient enough to make this practical? And can it be aware enough of overall 
data um, probability distributions to make the blurring effective and yet retain accuracy. So that's one of the things that, um, that I'm working on now to try to push on. So adding to my, my to-do list is this last arrow on what I would call technical elements of privacy. So for a long time, privacy was either viewed as security encryption of data, or it was viewed as policy mechanisms, you know, thou shall not um, look at this data or thou shall not store it in a particular way. And I think there's a, a new category of sort of technical elements around it as well. So uh, I just want to reiterate these sort of four steps to it and the, the, the opportunities that I see for um, hardware and software designers in, in particular and technologists in general to play a role um, in not abdicating our responsibility on some of these key issues. Because I'm fine with policymakers making policy, but I don't want to do it because of a technical vacuum. I want, to do it, I want them to do it in cases where um, we did our best technical job and there's still a little bit left to be handled by the policy and regulatory side of things. And just for a few minutes, I thought I would come back to how this all comes up in different um, policy arenas. And I thought I would give one concrete example, which is that um, after I had returned to Princeton during my re-enlistment year, uh, I was part of the US delegation to represent the US at uh, the World Telecommunication Standardization Assembly, WITSA, uh, which was held in Tunisia in late October, early November. So this was my fall break. Um, and I, I, I'll sort of talk generally about high OT, how IoT came up in a range of arenas, and then I'll talk more specifically about WITSA. So IoT was viewed by different countries as number one, a possible economic catalyst. So there's parts of the world where they want to jump on the IoT wagon as a way of kickstarting a new part of their economy. They want to get leadership, economic leadership in an area. Um, there are places where it was seen as a sort of scary mechanism that needed regulation to protect consumers. It was seen as a place where technical standards would be useful to foster development. It was seen as a place where technical standards would be useful to um, protect, to, to provide a level of protectionism by creating a playing field that was favorable to certain countries over other countries or companies over other companies. And in some countries, it was actually viewed as a chance to reboot fundamentals of who controls the internet. So if you are not happy with the multi-stakeholder model for how the internet is currently governed and how internet policy is currently managed, then, um, and there are some countries that feel that way, then some countries felt that the Internet of Things was sufficiently different that you could come in with a more governmental way of managing the Internet of Things uh, in contrast to the Internet more broadly. Uh, so how did this sort of play out? Uh, in some cases, they were encouraging IoT development and standards in a fairly broad and helpful way. And then in other places, they were encouraging it in a way that was going to create an unlevel playing field for different companies, uh, sort of their own versus other countries' companies. Um, and in some ways, um, they were using it to, as I said, try to assert control either through regulations or through standards over IoT operations and content and accounting slash charging in some ways that were benign and in other ways that were sort of creating obstacles or concerns for how the IoT would develop overall. So then within WITSA, how does this work? Um, so one recurring theme in ITU meetings is that uh, there's a set of around 50 or 60 countries um, that actually left early from a meeting in 2012 that tried to establish an operational role for the ITU in managing the internet. Uh, the US was one of those 59 countries. And so in a recurring theme in all of this is uh, the US trying to limit the operational role for the ITU and the internet. Um, so whenever the ITU meets, there's a sense of mm, how can we kind of defend against that resurging. Uh, WITSA is held every four years to set the agenda for the next four years of the standardization sector of the ITU. And some of the issues that took a lot of time at this WITSA were the Internet of Things, privacy, technical neutrality, and so forth. And the recurring theme is the degree to which technical issues 
and technical explanations get hijacked and used for sort of political purposes instead. And so with that, I am happy to answer questions. Thank you.